thank you all for coming. Um, my name is Cheryl Gagney. Uh, I'm from the Center for Psychiatric Rehabilitation here at Boston University. And on behalf of the university and the center, I'd like to welcome you to this lecture. Uh, there is a growing interest in the topic of campus mental health. And in fact, I don't know if you've had a chance to open your BU uh, Today uh, newspaper yet, but it's the lead story is on uh, an explanation of student privacy laws. Um, doesn't, historically, that wasn't headline news. Um, and I think the, the meeting this morning also reflects a growing interest and a growing anxiety around uh, the topic of mental health law. Um, and this growing interest has been fueled by two uh, developments on university campuses across the country. And these trends compete sometimes for prominence in our minds. Uh, the first development uh, have been the very tragic and highly publicized episodes of violence and suicide uh, committed by students that have called our attention to the need for improved communication, increased vigilance to identify students with a high potential for either violence or self-harm. And another trend, equally powerful, but certainly not highly publicized, is the presence of students who have psychiatric or mental health disorders who are engaged successfully in higher education, engaged in university life. Uh, students may struggle while on campus, but with the support of the university community, their friends, their families have experienced the full benefits of university life. So those two trends are, are growing and, and, and at times compete for interest in our, in our minds. Um, it's our hope that this lecture with Carolyn Wolf will encourage us to continue our discourse about supporting students with mental health problems to assist them in experiencing uh, success and happiness in their years at college. And with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Carolyn Wolf. Um, Carolyn has assured me that she, she does an introduction of herself um, at the beginning of her presentation, which is good because she's a member of a very large law practice and um, <laughs> with quite a large title, long title. And um, um, her area of law has, has historically been um, mental health law, health law, and elder rights. And currently, uh, she trains quite extensively nationally um, on the topic of campus mental health law. So it's our pleasure to welcome her here this morning, um, Carolyn. Good morning, and thank you for coming. Um, just by way of background, um, to put um, sort of my background in perspective, um, I actually started out as a hospital administrator, and I was a director of risk management at a major city hospital in New York for four years. Um, after having been to graduate school twice, um, one of those times at the Harvard School of Public Health. So I got to live here for a year and really loved it a lot. Um, and so I worked as a risk manager and then I had a psychotic episode and decided to go to law school. <laughs> And um, when I started my law practice, I stayed in healthcare law, but um, I was asked to do psychiatric hearings for hospitals. In New York, patients who are psychiatric inpatients have a right to a hearing if they don't want to have treatment or they don't want to stay in the hospital. And out of that practice grew um, hospital consulting on issues of mental health. Um, we counsel outpatient mental health centers um, on issues. Uh, related to psychiatric treatment and patient rights and so on. And we also work very closely with families and individuals who suffer from serious mental illness, helping them work through the, as you know, very complicated and overwhelming healthcare system and particularly the mental health system. Um, and about three years ago, I started getting asked by college counseling centers or college campus personnel the same questions that I was getting asked in the mental health world. What are the limits of confidentiality? Who can we speak to or who can't we speak to? Um, what kinds of policies do we need for, need for release of information and sharing of records? Um, and of course, the one area that I wasn't asked about a lot in my prior life was parental notification. Um, but we had a lot of discussion about when to call parents, when not to call parents, 
um, what information to share with them, and so on and so forth. And so um, I started a consulting company to work with college campuses to address all of these issues um, specific to students with serious mental health issues coming to campus. And as all of you know, more and more students are coming to campus with um, serious mental illness, with psychological disorders, with psychosocial issues, and so on. Um, and then, of course, as we know, approximately a year ago, Virginia Tech happened, um, followed several months later by Northern Illinois. And of course, the discussion about all of these concerns and issues um, just exploded, so to speak. And there was tremendous concern on college campuses as to what to do about these situations. Many states set up task forces to address these situations. Um, I actually sit on the Florida State of Florida task force to come up with um, ideas for addressing students with mental illness, um, student issues, and also the issues of safety and security. Um, but I've grappled a lot with how to do these presentations in the aftermath of Virginia Tech and Northern Illinois um, without equating mental illness directly to danger or violence. I've tried very hard to separate the two. Um, because I think that what's happened is, unfortunately, the shooters in those instances did have psychiatric histories. Um, and so the whole issue of students with mental illness got put into, into the mix of dealing with issues of campus safety and security. Um, and we in the mental health world have worked very hard over the years to destigmatize mental illness. Um, and so that I really have great concern about having that discussion or doing these presentations, integrating one directly with the other. Um, so when I was planning um, this program, I actually spoke to my psychiatrist pilot husband. Um, and he was very helpful in helping me to formulate a way to kind of um, separate the two issues. Um, so what we're going to do is talk about the issues of mental health and students with mental health on campus, and then we're going to talk about safety and security. Um, I also have left time at the end of this program for questions and answers and comments, and I very much encourage and welcome feedback from those of you in the audience, because um, I find it very educational and helpful for me. Um, and also helpful for each of you participating in these types of program. So I think it's important to take a step back for a moment from the specific legal and risk management topics um, and first bring the true underlying concepts in this area into focus. Um, as we all know, an increasing number of students are now coming to college and university campuses with serious mental illness, psychological issues, and um, psychosocial problems. Um, statistically, people with serious mental illness are no more at risk for violence than those in the general population. And in fact, people who suffer from mental illness are actually more victims of violence than they are perpetrators of violence in most cases. Um, so as I said, there's a need to kind of separate that discussion. Um, in the area of students with mental illness um, and psychological disorders, the related discussions that we're having um, focus really on the issue of resources. How do we increase mental health services for students on campus? Funding of those programs. Um, the actual provision of services. What services are we going to offer to the students? Um, and very important, early intervention and identification of students with the goal of prevention um, and ultimately of training people to identify students at risk, uh, red flag behavior, and so on. Um, then there are the questions at some point is should the student be separated from the campus community for treatment, stabilization, um, and then the chance to return back to school. If the answer is yes to that question, then that means development of policies and procedures and programs to oversee the student, um, this process, or the specific interventions that we're going to put in place in order for students to remain or come back to campus. Um, the issues need to be addressed in this area include oversight. How much of that are we going to do and what policies are we going to have in that regard? Uh, confidentiality, the big C word, um, which we're going to talk about specifically. The periodic reporting back and forth between the student, a family, and 
possibly the counseling center or the student affairs offices. Mandatory or voluntary counseling sessions, a very big debate on campus now as to the advantages and disadvantages of requiring these. Um, contracts for safety, um, also a very big issue on college campuses. What are the legalities of this? What are the clinical issues involved in having students contract for safety? Um, on and off campus communication, we talk a lot about that. The exchange of information, again, it goes to confidentiality and communication, um, but what are the issues when you send a student off campus and you don't have feedback or follow-up as to what's happening with them in an off-campus mental health setting versus when they come back to campus. How much information are we entitled to? How much are we not? How much should we require of students when they come back to campus? Um, if the answer is no, that the student can't come back to school, then likely it means the student is just not stable enough to return to the campus community. Either they're refractory to the treatment, they're non-compliant, um, there aren't enough resources available on the campus to meet their needs, or they're presenting signs and symptoms of their illness which are just too overwhelming to be able to be accommodated um, in a campus setting. Um, this needs to be addressed with the behavioral health professionals and others in authority, um, but needs to be looked at um, in a thoughtful way, not as a failure on our part to not be able to keep students on campuses. And that's an issue that comes up a lot in this area. How long should we keep them on campus? And what are the risks and benefits of providing uh, <laughs> services that maybe we're not trained enough to do or don't have the resources to do versus um, sending the kids off campus or back home? Um, OK. In my my opinion, the Virginia Tech and the Northern Illinois shooters and the incidents were what we like to call in the healthcare world outliers. Um, these were students who were on people, well, at least in Virginia Tech, were on people's radar screens. Um, but we know now that we need to develop more comprehensive policies and systems of communication to share that information. Although statistically, given the number of campuses that we have across the country and the number of students who are enrolled on these campuses, the numbers of these occurrences, thankfully, are statistically significantly small. Um, however, they are catastrophic. And of course, certainly to the families of the injured and killed, um, they are catastrophic and tragic as well. But it's also a tragedy for the schools themselves. Um, it, the overflow of these incidents results in loss of reputation, loss of confidence, and potentially loss of funding from the schools. Um, issues of students with mental illness on campus um, has broad implications. Um, but we have to be able to address these overall concerns without using words like tracking targeting, stigmatizing, singling out students with mental illness or psychological issues, as was actually proposed um, by many of the state and federal legislatures following the Virginia Tech tragedy. And those of us in mental health worked very hard to convince legislators that the idea of identifying or tracking was not the way to go in this area. Um, Right now, based on current data, we can make the assumption that there will be more and more students coming to campus with serious psychiatric illness or psychological disorders. Um, and students who come with psychiatric diagnoses come now, um, why? Because we have newer medications. We have fewer side effects of the medications in the market. There's less stigma attached to having a mental illness. There's more open discussion about mental illness. And there's more social acceptance of mental illness being a medical problem or a brain disorder. There's also more mainstreaming. There's more media attention and education. Um, and most importantly, this is the age at which psychiatric disorders manifest the 16, 18, to 22, 23 year olds. Why are we seeing more students with psychological and psychosocial disorders? The stress, the competition, the pressure from parents, the peer pressure, the body image issues, and the constant bombardment from the media and the technology creates a tremendous amount of stress and pressure on these kids. I have two teenagers, I know. 
Um, counseling centers were never designed to be many outpatient mental health centers, but that is exactly what they have become. And it was really interesting for me to be called upon by these counseling centers to talk about issues that for the last 20 or so years I've talked about with outpatient community mental health centers. Um, but what does this mean for the schools themselves? Well, there needs to be an overall plan to address the growing trend and growing need for a response to this ever-changing campus community. Increased funding for counseling center services, mental health programs, education and training, and very important confidentiality safeguards. That is really one of the biggest issues that's being addressed currently in this whole area is the issue of confidentiality. The balancing of privacy and individual rights and the sacrosanct confidentiality that goes along with mental health treatment versus the campus safety and security or the safety and security of the community. Um, what needs to be focused on here too is the mental health continuum of care. There's a beginning and an end point and a tremendous spectrum in the middle as to what services will be offered, what issues need to be addressed, and so on. Um, there needs to be a raising of awareness as to what these issues are, but what these issues are, but they need to be factual and accurate and realistic um, in the way they're presented. Um, we strongly encourage early intervention programs and processes. Um, because you can increase the probability of prevention. You can never assure the possibility of prevention. Um, everything as um, we see when we cross-examine witnesses, lawyers who are not doing well in their case will always say to a witness, isn't it possible? Isn't something possible? So there are everything really the psychiatrists tell me is possible. However, the real issue here is probability. Um, it's cannot, um, you can't decrease or impact possibility, but you certainly can decrease an impact on probability. Um, and then we have the tremendous amount of misinformation with regard to federal and state law in this area. As we talked about at the roundtable before this presentation, um, there is the ever popular FERPA law. That is the education law. It is a federal law. It governs education records. And when examining these laws, step one really is just knowledge of what the law is, what it governs, who has access to records, what information is specific to the education law, and so on. But more important is the step two in this process, which are the exceptions to these laws. There, again, is a tremendous amount of misinformation as to what information can be accessed and released based on the exceptions to these laws. And the FERPA law has always had significant exceptions to it, exceptions such as the emergency situation. If there's knowledge of the information, it's necessary to protect the health and safety of the student or others, you can release that information. One of the little-known exceptions um, is that of a student being an exemption on a parent's tax returns automatically gives the school the ability to notify parents, um, and so on and so forth. So it's very important to, again, know the law, but also know what the exceptions are to the law. Now, specifically, education or FERPA records are excluded from treatment records. So we need to keep in mind that there is there are education records on the one hand and treatment records on the other. Um, and those are records that are made or maintained by a physician, a psychiatrist, a psychologist, or an other recognized professional or power, power professional acting in their capacity. Um, they have to be maintained and used only in connection with treatment of a student, and they can only be disclosed to individuals who are providing that treatment with, again, certain exceptions. And as I was saying earlier, um, there are no FERPA police out there. I am here to assure you of that. There are no HIPAA police out there. So everyone is at this heightened sense of panic over these laws that are in place, but in fact, they are complaint driven. There are very few complaints made um, with these laws. And um, in fact, HIPAA often does not apply to a college campus 
because what is covered under the HIPAA federal regulations is that information that's transmitted back and forth electronically, and many campuses don't fit into that definition. More importantly, though, than the federal HIPAA law are the state confidentiality laws. And those actually are the laws which should be of greater concern to people on a college campus because they govern all, if uh, many, if not all, of the student health counseling centers on your campuses. Confidentiality laws pertain to these medical records of students. They're not then they are not therefore covered by FERPA because they're not education records, they're treatment records. Uh, mental health professionals are bound by the legal and ethical constraints and guidelines in this area. And confidentiality, of course, is the bedrock of mental health and health care practice. Confidentiality is also what makes the counseling centers user friendly for students. It encourages them to come and be comfortable seeking services and remaining in treatment. Once the mainstay of mental health care begins to give way or the confidentiality gives way or is, is even rumored to give way, there may become a chilling effect on students utilizing these services. And this is a tremendous amount of what we're grappling with in this area. How much do we yield on confidentiality in order to theoretically attain safety and security on campus, yet not chill the effect of students coming to campus? And when are students most at risk to be violent when they're not in treatment? So we have this dilemma of which side of which line do we fall on in making decisions as to how to address students with psychiatric and psychological issues on campus. Um, mental health professionals also uh, risk legal challenges, malpractice actions, ethical licensure challenges, professional misconduct allegations. Again, confidentiality is the bedrock of these decisions as well. But in confidentiality in this new era of increasing numbers of students coming to campus with serious mental illness is increasingly under pressure to yield to the safety and security. And again, the real question is how far do we let that go? Um, one of the answers to how far we can yield goes to policy decisions. We need to make a policy determination as to how we want to address this. And individual campus perspectives, when you talk about what is imminent risk or danger, and when is that standard met or not met. There needs to be clear-cut policies and protocols and guidelines, as well as a centralized decision maker who will evaluate the questions that arise with regard to confidentiality um, and then make policy decisions in response. Also very important in this area is a comprehensive education and training program so that decisions can be made in an organized and thoughtful way. Um, also, the, the issue of shifting the confidentiality constraints lies in the utilization of administrative staff. Take it out of the counseling centers. Take it away from the healthcare mental health professionals to make these determinations or have to release or breach confidentiality. And we recommend put them into the administrative realm, the deans of students, the ju judicial affairs officers, um, utilization of the student code of conduct, um, and campus policies and procedures which have circulated on and off campus and can perform this function regarding releasing of information as necessary. Um, just other topics in this area that um, we talk about a lot are duty to warn statutes. Um, duty to warn statutes are the Tarasoff laws. Um, as I'm sure you all know, Tarasoff was a case in California where a man told his therapist that he had thoughts of and a plan to kill his girlfriend. The therapist, believing that they were bound by confidentiality, did not warn the intended victim. And in fact, he did murder his girlfriend and the family brought suit. And so states across the country developed what are called Tarasoff or duty to warn statutes. Um, these statu some states have must warn statutes, meaning a therapist has to warn. Some states have may warn statutes, meaning it's a matter of judges, uh, judgment. I'm here to tell you that these cases always come up on Friday at 4.30 in the afternoon. They are never Monday morning. We have the whole week to think about this and decide. 
They're also never black and white. The Tarasov duty to warn statutes require that there be an intended victim and a plan to harm and a means and a mechanism to harm. Um, so that if someone says, I have a gun, I'm thinking of going to the mall, I want to hurt a lot of people, that would not fall under the Tarasov duty to warn statute, but certainly would be of great concern and makes us, um, makes us need to come to a determination as to the, just the general breach of confidentiality issues. Um, but the Tarasov cases are always gray area cases. Scenarios like, I've never liked my mother-in-law, I'm thinking about killing her, I do walk past a gun store on my way home, and I may go that way or I may go another way, but I certainly have thoughts about this. Um, and what happens when we're faced with these cases? We have to make a judgment call and a reasonable and rational decision, and we have to take a risk on whether to breach the confidentiality or not. Um, and again, there are no clear-cut legal guidelines that say if you do this, the answer is yes, if you do that, the answer is no. Um, they really are thoughtful, detailed discussions based on judgment and experience that helps us to make these decisions. Um, another issue that we talk about a lot in this area is simply the issue of pick your liability. Um, this is um, what we used a lot in the healthcare system and continue to use. Um, it's expounded by risk managers all over the world. Um, but because there are not a lot of clear cut guidelines in these areas, often what you come down to is exactly that you play pick your liability. I would always rather defend a lawsuit for breach of confidentiality, and I will always recommend that you err on the side of breach of confidentiality versus wrongful death. You can undo confidentiality. You cannot undo death. And um, the decisions that have to be made in this area, again, are which side of the line do you want to come down to, and how do you balance the confidentiality with the potential for injury and death? I'm also thinking in this area is there's the legal answer and then there's the common sense answer. And I think we've lost sight of using our judgment and experience, using our gut reactions to things, using our instincts in coming up with a way to address these situations that really are more the common sense perspective than the straight legal perspective. Um, finally, always err on the side of best interest of the student community safety, and the risk benefit. Um, and then there's documentation, which we'll talk about in a moment. OK. Um, anybody else? <laughs> Okay, what else do we want to talk about and look at in this area? Well, we want to talk about the counseling and mental health services and making them more user-friendly, um, places of trust, safe haven for the students, um, a beneficial intervention for them, as well as an opportunity for the student to be stabilized and return to the community as is appropriate. There must be from administration protection of and respect for the counseling center mandate and the professional obligations of those who work within its confines. It's very easy to say, let's call parents, let's breach confidentiality, we've got to talk about this, we have to circulate the information. But the, the, the burden really falls on the counseling centers and the mental health professionals, professionals to stay stop. Wait a second, confidentiality really is of paramount importance, and if we're going to violate that, we better have a really good reason why and justification as to how we're going to do that. Um, the issues specific to that area are release of information and release of records. The state laws govern those issues. When can you release information? Who has access to those records? It's very important to be familiar with those areas of the law. Parental notification decisions, and we talked about that earlier this morning. When do we call parents? When do we hear from parents? What do we hear from parents? And how do we get those helicopters out of the sky and back on the ground? Um, helicopter parents now are in the middle schools and the high schools. They're hovering over their students from very early on. But they've arrived on our college campuses. 
And um, these are parents who are calling continuously and constantly and wanting information. And we need to have policies and protocols as to how we're going to respond to those requests. Um, also, the issue of sharing of information on an intra-campus-wide basis, um, as well as an off-campus basis. And increasingly, if we're seeing students with these difficulties and we're not able to manage them on campus, we are going to be sending them off campus to receive services and interventions. So we need to come up with policies and guidelines and protocols as, as to what information is going to leave campus and go out into the emergency room, outpatient mental health centering, private practitioners, and what information do we want to come back to campus? Do we want to know that the student was admitted to an inpatient psychiatric unit? Do we want to know they were prescribed medication? Do we want to know what those medications are? And do we not want to know whether we need to be keeping an eye on those students when they return to campus? Um, we need to train our staff on the issue of receiving and sharing information. Um, we work very hard to train our resident staff and our physician staff that even though you can't talk to people if you don't have a release for the information, you can listen. And this is a very important instruction to give medical and mental health professionals. There is nothing that constrains us from saying to someone, I can't confirm or deny that your son or daughter is in our counseling center. I can't tell you anything about them if they were to be one of our patients or one of our students. But I can listen. Tell me what it is you want, to, you want me to hear. And you can take in that information. Often that is very, very important and helpful information when we're attempting to intervene with a student. Um, we also work very hard to train parents not to be insulted when they call a counseling center and the counselor says to them, I can't confirm or deny that your son or daughter is a, being seen by our center. I can't tell you anything about them. We try to train parents that this is the response that legally we are required to give them, but again, they can speak to the professional and give them information. And as we all know, taking a history, getting outside information is of critical importance when we're seeing these students. Requiring or requesting student waivers or releases. A lot of controversy in this area as to whether parents should pressure their students to sign releases and waivers, whether there really is informed consent on the part of the parent or the institution in having students sign these waivers, um, and when does that become of paramount important versus would be nice to have. Um, mandatory versus voluntary counseling centers, a lot of discussion about that as well. Um, policies and procedures need to de be developed regarding medical leaves and when students can return to campus and under what conditions they can return to campus. Are there mandatory counseling centers when they return? Do they have to bring a note from their outside therapist? Are they going to be followed while on campus and so on? All questions and issues that need to be addressed and need to be put into policies and procedures. Um, also, the issue of outside referrals and communicating or sharing of information, as I've said. Okay. Um, what is the bottom line in addressing these concerns and making these decisions? Um, pick your liability, as I talked about, and really the realities of what is the liability exposure in this area. Um, right now, happily, thankfully for all of you, the exposure is generally very low. There are very few lawsuits being brought against college campuses. So although the potential is always there, and people always ask me, can I be sued for this? The answer is yes, you can be sued for anything and everything, and everybody's brother-in-law is a lawyer. So that is really not the threshold question in this area. The real question is how defensible are you? Do you have policies and procedures in place that are helpful and can guide you and can give you legal support for the actions that you take? Um, what 18-year-old do you know of has a lawyer on retainer or can even afford to pay a lawyer to sue the institution? Very few that I know of, and I'd like to meet the ones that do. Um, so it's very important to keep that in perspective, and I think that's what cr created some of the hysteria on campus also, is the idea that there's this 
overwhelming potential to be sued and to have liability in this area. And in fact, right now, the reality is there is minimal liability exposure in terms of actual cases. Um, okay. Now, There is good news and bad news in that issue of liability exposure. The good news, as I've said, is that there are not many cases in this area right now. But the bad news, then, is that we have very little case law to guide us. That's really what, in large part, gives us direction when we make decisions in the legal realm. Um, and of course, no one wants to be the test case. So we all work very hard to be very defensible um, and not get these laws, have these lawsuits brought to us, um, but it also creates a lot of question and anxiety as to what really the law is, what it says, and the definitions in the law. We have no idea. De determinations and definitions of what constitutes imminent risk or a direct threat or imminent harm or what really is danger to self or others. And of course, working in the medical area, we know there is a tremendous spectrum of what constitutes those definitions. So again, based on our judgment, our experience, do we make these determinations and hope that they will be supported? Um, very important in this area, particularly, is documentation. Documentation of what our thinking is, what our reasoning is, what we are seeing before us. What are the signs and symptoms that that student is presenting? What are they saying to us? Using quotations when we need to in records in order to reflect what we have been told and what our response is going to be to those conversations. So what has been our response on campus to all of the concerns that I've outlined? Well, many campuses have chosen to develop what are called crisis or behavioral intervention teams. Um, they are helpful in addressing students at risk and identifying those areas that are of great concern um, brought by any number of people across campus. Um, but generally, they're very narrow in scope, and they focus mainly on the individual students. Um, some have been in, in existence for a long time. Um, which leads to being very comfortable with one another and not necessarily objective over a period of time. Um, they also may be limited in what they can do based on confidentiality concerns. Um, and again, it puts the Counseling Center staff in a difficult position, although um, for those teams that um, are functioning, Counseling Center staff usually attend, don't speak, take in the information, and then follow up as they deem it to be appropriate. Um, but it does sometimes put them in a very difficult, tenuous position. Um, so what are the possible alternatives or adjuncts to a crisis or behavioral intervention team? Well, one possible alternative is the development of a centralized reporting system using technology. Um, it's a centralized way of inputting, evaluating, reporting, or acting upon um, information that's gathered from across campus from a variety of disciplines. And if reported and evaluated in real time, then there can be a timely response, and then the institution or use of prevention and training rather than responding in crisis mode. Um, another Another possible alternative here is the development of a centralized, broad-based repository of data and information using human intelligence and experience. That is not a new concept. Everybody thinks that it is, but using human intelligence and experience continues to work even after all these years. Um, and it can be a resource across all campus dis disciplines. Um, one version of this is, called, is development of what's called an Office of Mental Health on campus, um, also known as a single point of contact office. Um, which collects the information and then disseminates it as it deems appropriate. Um, one recommendation we make is that an office like that is headed by a mental health expert. Staffing as needed is multidisciplinary um, based on experts from the educational, the legal, the clinical, the public policy, and law enforcement perspectives. Um, the more glo it has a more global perspective on issues dealing with mental health and safety. 
Um, generally, these um, offices can do what I like to call think out of the box. It's very easy to get focused on what the individual or at the moment crisis is. But as I said, because the laws are not that clear cut and the definitions are left open to interpretation, what do we do on a daily basis when facing these issues? We think out of the box and we need to continue to do that. Um, what an office like that can be charged with, it can integrate processes for reporting of the data and for collecting the data. Um, it can also make budgetary recommendations, something that a crisis team can't do. Um, and it can prioritize needs, needs as they're assessed with regard to mental health, security, proactive versus reactive training programs, and where to train and whom to train. Um, the other thing that these offices can do is the development, review, and revision of policies and protocols or procedures, which the crisis teams don't do. Um, again, with a multidisciplinary approach, inviting disciplines from all over campus. Um, it can conduct periodic audits and reviews of system, which is not done a lot on campuses or hasn't been in the past, but we recommend be done now. Training programs, outcomes, and the creation of best practices to address these areas. Um, the, also, there needs to be modification or revision um, or reworking of the policies in place now and what needs to evolve from those. Okay. It's also helpful to consider addressing behavioral health concerns on campus as would be addressed in the community at large. After all, the campus community is really a microcosm of the surrounding community in which it lives. Um, and the actual statistics, in fact, bear that out. And what are the issues that we deal with on a college campus um, that we also deal with in a community setting? We have students coming that are who are medically non medication non-compliant, um, taking medication holidays. You see that written about and talked about. They've been on medication. They come to college. They don't want to be stigmatized. They don't want to be um, have to take medication. So they self-holiday on these medications, with often resulting decompensations. They're sharing medications with other students in the dorms and in their classrooms. Um, they're playing around with the dosages. I feel sedated, or I feel depressed, or I feel I can't think and be creative. So they s lower the dosages or change the dosages. Um, comorbidities with substance abuse, a very big problem on campus, the dual diagnosed um, student. Um, often we see medical implications of psychiatric illnesses, such as anorexia and other de eating disorders. Um, as well as medical illnesses that manifest through psychiatric symptoms. So we have all of these issues specific to students with mental illness that we've seen in the community at large all of these years that we now are seeing on college campuses. We have to um, think about offering evaluation, treatment plans, ongoing availability. What hours are the counseling centers going to be open and available? Some campuses have them open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Some of them only have the staffing and resources to um, keep them open certain hours of the day or certain days of the week. Um, and I just want to tell you that 24 hours a day, seven days a week is what's called magical thinking in psychiatric terms. That is on everyone's wish list, but many campuses just don't have the resources or the funding to do that. Um, we also need to have an identification system of behavioral concerns um, and train people across campus, particularly faculty and students, to identify what are called students at risk or the red flags on campus. Um, train staff to ask questions about the cues that they're seeing. You know, faculty see students on a daily basis. They can recognize changes in behaviors, erratic behaviors, change in writings, and so on and so forth. Um, and we need to set up a system as to when these cues or red flags are identified, what do we do with them? Where do they go? Which means then that you have to develop policies and procedures to direct that information to persons in authority 
who are in a position to intervene in these circumstances, whether it be a clinical intervention through the counseling centers or off-campus mental health facilities, um, or whether it be a legal intervention or a, an administrative intervention through the codes of conduct or the student affairs offices or the disabilities offices. But it's important to get the word out not only to faculty but to students themselves. Um, who can possibly pass along this information if they're comfortable with and are knowledgeable about the system in place to do that. We need to tell students and educate them that this is not tattletaling. We're not rat you're not ratting out your peers. But in fact, the life you save could be your own or could be someone else's. Um, that they can intervene in a positive way in their roommates' lives or their peers' lives or their friends' lives. And that, in fact, it is a loyalty to their friend that, in fact, should motivate them to come and seek help and assistance um, when they recognize behavior of concern or observe things that the person would like to keep secret but, in fact, could mean impact on their life and on their health. Okay, so we're really at a crossroads in the decision-making process in all of this. Um, one of those crossroads is the, uh, the question of whether students should remain on campus and we have the resources and the availability to treat them, or they should leave campus and then return at a later date, or whether they should go home and not return. And again, it's important to educate the staff who are caring from them that going home and not being able to su succeed on campus is not a failure on our part. It is simply the nature of what the student is presenting with us, presenting to us. Um, keeping students on campus um, is a question of what resources and treatments and intervention we can offer versus what's in the community at large. I've had counselors from rural areas in particular say to me that they keep students on campus a lot longer than they normally would because they believe they can do a better job of treating these kids. The surrounding mental health clinics um, either have professionals coming in once a month or once a week, don't have the resources, there aren't good lines of communication back and forth, so they're never sure what kind of treatment the student is getting. Um, so they're keeping students on campus longer, but then we have to keep in mind what are the risks and benefits of doing that in terms of professional standards and meeting the appropriate policies and procedures. And again, we need to develop those policies and protocols to address each of these steps that we take in our decision-making process. Okay, bottom line in all of this is documentation. Documentation is what is key in all of this. Um, from a liability poten potential or from good risk management practice, um, the adage, if it's not written, written, it didn't happen, holds true. If you need to get into a situation of your word against mine, it's very difficult to make a case or be defensible should an action arise. Medical record um, and education record documentation can either be your best friend or your worst enemy. And that's why we spend a lot of time training staff as to appropriate record documentation. Records are not the place for labor disputes, interpersonal relationship disputes, um, complaining about there's the lack of staff or the lack of time, and so on and so forth. Cutesy little sayings are not a good idea in a medical record. I had a resident once who wrote, patient going home tomorrow, hip, hip, hooray. It was very entertaining for us to read this record, but not very entertaining when it was being read by a judge and a jury in a lawsuit. Um, and one thing that everyone should keep in mind and keep first and foremost in their mind is the idea that we are no longer the only ones reading our own records. Students have access to their records by law. Parents have access to records by law under certain circumstances, um, as well as administrative bodies, governmental bodies, insurance companies. Um, and so on and so forth. So always document, document your records, keeping in mind that you are not the only ones who will be reading these records. And if you keep that in the back of your head and you look at what it is you're writing, um, again, pr 
um, following ethical and legal and clinical guidelines, that record can be very helpful. Um, so you've noticed that I didn't say a lot about safety and security up to this point in time in my presentation. Um, and that's because, as I said at the outset, I want to keep the mental health issues somewhat separate from the safety and security issues. Um, but it is, of course, necessary to talk about in these discussions. Um, and so that's um, where we're going to move into at this point. Now, interestingly, in doing this research and consulting with my psychiatrist pilot husband, we talked about the very clear analogy which can be drawn between the current world in which schools of higher education find themselves and the airline industry. Statistically, flying is one of the safest activities which an individual can engage in, borne out by experts in the field, published articles, professional journals. And given the numbers of people flying every day and the millions of people, the number of planes flying and the number of people flying, thankfully there are relatively few accidents and in turn few loss of lives or serious injuries. However, one plane accident is catastrophic. They're mostly under unpredictable, so they're shocking. Many people are injured or killed in one moment in time. And these occurrences are dramatic and tragic in nature, media blitzes over days, months, or years of time. Significantly financially costly to the airline company specifically and the airline industry as a whole as airline travel decreases for that one airline or the industry in general. And certainly we all saw this after 9-11. Therefore, airlines spend millions of dollars in programs, resources, and safety precautions, doing studies, evaluations, and training to prevent or avoid a catastrophic event which is extremely unlikely, but not zero unlikely, to occur. It is in their care and concern for people and ultimately their financial interest that they make these investments. Statistically, college and university campuses are one of the safest places to be present. This is also borne out by experts in the field, in published articles, and professional journals. And given the number of college campuses on our, and, uh, across the country and study abroad programs, as well as the thousands of students who are enrolled on these campuses, thankfully there are relatively few accidents and in turn, few loss of life and serious injury. However, one campus shooting is catastrophic. They're mostly unpredictable and they are shocking. Many people have been injured and killed in one moment in time. Certainly in the case of the recent campus shootings, this has become multiple occurrences in a relatively short period of time. Um, these occurrences are tragic and dramatic in nature. There are tremendous media blitzes over days, months, and now years of time. And they are possibly, although there is less history to fall back on in this area, significantly financially costly to the schools individually or the higher education industry as a whole, given the potential for decreased enrollment, funding, alumni contributions, and so on. And since this is a more recent occurrence than the histories we have in the airline industry, really only time will tell. Therefore, colleges and universities are talking about spending a great deal of money on programs, resources, safety and security precautions, and other interventions to avoid a catastrophic event which is extremely unlikely, although not zero unlikely, to occur. And they, like the airline industry, must do this and do it thoughtfully and quickly. It's in everyone's interest to do this. Given the climate as it now exists and on into the future, there really is little choice than having to do this. And in fact, schools are, in response, coming up with a tremendous variety and variation on safety and security plans and so on. Okay, what is the safety and security role of law enforcement in this continuum of addressing risk on campus? Well, campus police can 
participate in prevention, which I believe is really the key to addressing students at risk at ca on campus and to decreasing the probability that there will be increased numbers of incidences, occurrences, and tragedies on campus. Campus law enforcement are really the eyes and ears on campus. They're out there around campus, um, in the dorms, in the student unions, and so on. And many campuses are developing special training programs, such as CIT training, as um, law enforcement in the communities do, campus intervention, crisis intervention team training, teaching law enforcement how to address students at risk or those with serious mental or psychological issues. Um, the other suggestion that's been made for law enforcement is developing neighborhood policing, assigning law enforcement or campus security to specific areas of a college campus. In that way, they get to know the students, they get to know the students' routines and habits, and the students get to know who they are and trust them. They become friends with the students, not just adversaries. They're not just there to give out parking tickets and tell students to move their cars out of the fire zones. Um, but in fact, they get to know on a more personal basis the students with whom they interact. Um, very important role for campus security is the integration with off-campus law enforcement. Um, they are not bound by the FERPA and HIPAA and state confidentiality laws. So often their eyes and ears can go to great lengths to inform and prevent um, students who, um, st potential for student violence on campus. Um, they do have a reporting function under the Cleary Act, but again, they're not bound by the education and healthcare confidentiality requirements. Law enforcement, though, are responsive once a crisis arises. So their job right now is more reactive than proactive. And we're working hard to change that dynamic. Um, again, because proactive and prevention really has the greatest chance of reducing the potential for risk on campus. Um, law enforcement continue to need to demonstrate the steps that they're taking to protect the campus. And they need to show that the resources that they're using are being directed towards safety. Again, it's money that needs to be spent um, because we do need to demonstrate and from a practical perspective need to have safety and security programs on campus. They can also be consultative and participate in behavioral or crisis team activities. And they can be the expert input into an office of mental health should one be creative. On campus and office, off campus integration and communication is key in this area. Um, there need to be coordinated efforts between our campus security and surrounding law enforcement, as well as um, what we recommend um, in terms of coordinated training programs. Um, and sometimes there, are ev there is even the potential for coordinating, coordinating funding of training and education programs, both on and off campus. And as with mental health centers in the community, we recommend with law enforcement that they do what are called class trips. Actually have people from campus go off into the community to either the mental health centers or to, camp to off-campus law enforcement introduce themselves, get to know who the point people are, get, get a phone number of who to call in a crisis, and have integrated policies and procedures as to who's, whom to call and when. Um, the issue of drills comes up a lot in this area, and why do we have them? Um, we need to develop these and spend money on these and use technology for these, even though statistically, again, these events are unlikely, um, but certainly possible to happen. Um, okay. So finally, um, we can achieve separation of behavioral health and safety security discussion. Um, sadly, though, the high profile and stunning recent events on higher education campuses revealed that the shooter suffered from mental illness. But again, there are millions of students on our campus who attend thousands of our colleges. Um, who and very few of these are involved in serious injuries or killings. We must direct our attention and resources to prevention, education and training to address the behavioral health issues, 
keeping in the forefront the legal, ethical, clinical, and public policy concerns that we face. Um, and confidentiality at the helm must become a policy determination addressed in a thoughtful context, again, in light of the legal, ethical, clinical, and public policy concerns that we face. Thank you. And now I would welcome any questions or comments. Thank you. Oh. Thank you very much. That was really very helpful. Would you speak in further detail, though, uh, to the situation where um, we are recommending a student take a leave of absence because of concerns about the student's safety and where they don't want to, and how uh, you know the um, issues of disability rights in terms of students being asked to leave a university involuntarily until they're you know uh, received care and ready to. That's what's called a compound question, which I will try hard and tease apart. Um, one of the issues that needs to be looked at in making this decision is who's going to be involved in the decision-making process. And either coming up with policies or protocols that will address that, or having guidelines within whatever center it is is raising the issue, whether it's the counseling center or the dean of students or the judicial affairs office or the disabilities office. So there needs to be a mechanism, um, first of all, to address the question and then come up with a thoughtful way of teasing apart the different issues and ultimately getting to a decision. Um, as to whether a student should stay on campus or leave campus. Now, the disabilities law govern those students who self-report that they have a disability, and there are specific legal guidelines and standards which must be addressed. Um, we need to be able to give reasonable accommodation to the student, um, and the student um, can be removed or um, can go into the judicial affairs area if they meet the direct threat test. Um, and there are specific criteria for that. So what needs to happen is we need to look at what is the specific case we're talking about. What are the signs and symptoms of the illness? What is the history of the student? What has gone on on campus as reported by a variety of disciplines? We need to hear from the faculty. We need to hear from the RAs. We may need to hear from roommates if that's appropriate. Um, and we may also need to hear from off-campus professionals as to what is the history of this student. Sometimes we can get that information, sometimes we can't. Sometimes we need to take legal steps to get that information or not. Um, but it's very important to make these decisions not in, isola not in isolation, but as a team approach. Get everyone in a room. I'm very big about getting everybody in a room together. What happens a lot of times in these cases is that the deans talk to the student affairs, the counseling center speaks to the faculty. Everybody is sort of disjointed in who, whom they're speaking to and what information they're getting. Um, when these decisions are made, because they are very serious decisions and have legal and clinical implications, it's very helpful, I find, to put everybody in a room together. Everybody is hearing the same thing at the same time, sharing the same or different information, and then a very thoughtful process can take place to make this decision. Um, also, knowledge of what the institution's policies and procedures are with regard to sending kids off campus. And then once all of those steps have been taken, very important that someone document, either in a medical record, an education record, or whatever is appropriate and part of your institutional policies, what steps were taken, what laws were considered, what clinical issues were considered, and why the ultimate decision was made. The, the, the request was to um, address the recent on-campus and off-campus um, incidents that have occurred, uh, criminal incidents. Um, 
um, in, on BU and in the surrounding areas. Um, it goes back to what I talked about in terms of law enforcement. Very important is the integration of campus law enforcement with the surrounding law enforcement community. Um, developing policies and protocols as to when to contact off-campus uh, law enforcement, policies and protocols as to what information can be gathered and shared, um, training as to when to call off-campus law enforcement. Um, also, information on what you are entitled to or what campus law enforcement is entitled to and what they're not, and what is required for off-campus law enforcement to share with us. And finally, there needs to be a central gathering or repository of where this information is going to be gathered, kept, and then where it's going to be disseminated or what changes in policies and pro protocols are going to take place as a result of these incidents. So even though right now we're sort of in crisis mode and having to address the immediate needs and questions, once the crisis averts, it's very important to do an exit conference sort of thing or and to get campus and off-campus law enforcement together, examine what the incidents were, examine what the response was, and think about what could be done differently or more effectively and efficiently in the future. Yes. With the first uh, set of questions, you were, at, you were saying that you'd like people to be in a room together. I think that sounds great. I'm just wondering, are you also saying that the student themselves should get to be there as well, so that they're in a position to sort of negotiate and figure out what works best for them? Not necessarily. And that's where you get into the code of conduct, judicial affairs realm, where you actually are talking about a hearing or a disciplinary proceeding. Um, what I'm talking about in terms of getting everybody in a room together are really those in authority who are in a position to make those determinations and decisions. Now, you will want those people to bring student information with them. You want to know what's been going on in the classroom, what's been going on on the quad, what's been going on in the dorm, and so on. Um, and you want to know what's been going on in the counseling center, but with the idea that there are confidentiality constraints in that in those discussions. So that gets a lot more tricky, um, but there needs to be some information about concerns possibly, um, red flag behavior, identifying the student as being at risk and why they are and how we need to manage that. Um, but I don't know that it's helpful at that juncture to have the student present because, again, you're, you need to make that decision before you're going to go back and present it to the student or the parent. Okay, I guess, it, I'm, I guess I'm just um, sort of disappointed that you're in some way implying that everyone else is authority and that that student isn't an authority on their own individual needs. So. No, I'm, I'm not saying they should be excluded, and I think the student really is an authority to some extent or sometimes to a large extent as to what they need. And certainly there needs to be response um, and input from the student. Um, but I think initially there needs to be a discussion of whether this is an appropriate situation to even bring back to the student. I mean, maybe we find out that it's just the student's having a bad week or under stress because it's finals or wrote a paper that's really just a creative student writing as opposed to something that we deem to be scary or potentially threatening, and then make a determination as to where that's going to go. And then, yes, there should be student involvement at some point. I'm sorry if I gave you that impression. I didn't mean to. Thank you. Um, my question is, in the event of an improbable but possible event on a community campus, what would be an appropriate behavioral health response from the community? Could you just be more specific? Now, what kind of crisis response should the community have in terms of those of us who are behavioral health providers? In the surrounding crisis? community? No, in our campus um, response in terms so in the event of a shooting or some other uh, improbable but possible event, what are your thoughts or your experience uh, with different um, communities about how they've responded to this with the behavioral health needs? Well, certainly we saw in Virginia Tech and Northern Illinois and other um, 
situations like that where the counseling center staff, the behavioral health staff were phenomenal and amazing in their response. Um, really fanned out across the campus community. Um, in, on some campuses, they chose to break them up into segments, um, but certainly were there and available. Um, also, the response from outside campuses and counselors from other campus settings um, came onto campus and were very helpful and volunteered a tremendous amount of time in being responsible to the crisis need um, and, and intervened with every discipline on campus, had sessions with law enforcement, had sessions with first responders, had sessions with faculty, had sessions with victims and victims' families. I mean, it really was an amazing response um, although not unpredictable given what you folks do for a living and the level of commitment that I see um, with counselors across the country. You are the most, one of the most dedicated mental health professionals um, I have met in my 20 years of doing mental health law. Um, so that the response was immediate, it was thoughtful, it was professional, and I think was of tremendous benefit to anybody and everybody who was involved in the crisis. Yes. Hi, I'm Phil. I'm a staff psychiatrist at our student health service, and not infrequently I evaluate students with respect to whether it makes sense for them to take a leave of absence, and particularly whether they're ready to come back from a leave of absence. And since we're in the city and we are not a comprehensive community mental health center, our model generally is for students who have chronic illness refer them to private practitioners in the city. So my question is, if I um, speak to a student's treatment team from back home and the student and family and decide that the student should come back and continue treatment and the student has private treatment, can I legally um, add the condition that the student has to come in to see me or one of my colleagues periodically to make sure that the treatment is continuing and that the student is continuing to respond to treatment or at least to give permission to the private practitioner to let us know if the student either decompensates or stops the private treatment because it could happen and it has happened that the student drops out of treatment without our knowing about it. Perhaps the student has a psychotic illness and decompensates, but had that been caught in time, we might have been able to get the student back on track. Much of the answer to that question goes to institutional um, guidelines and institutional policies. Different schools are taking different positions on that um, as to whether they're requiring um, communication back and forth, documentation from a private psychiatrist. Many schools are actually not even relying on the student's therapist, but are asking for a second opinion or a, an independent evaluation of the student, believing that sometimes the, the private therapist is biased. Um, in a positive way, wanting the student to come back to school and participate, yet may not be objective. Um, and so each campus has really been addressing that question um, based on their own um, institutional guidelines, their own professional input from staff, and are making policy decisions as to how to set up those protocols and to what to require back and forth. Um, be, between the on and off campus treaters. Um, they're also working with their um, judicial affairs offices, their disabilities offices, the deans, to come up with a reasonable protocol for bringing students back onto campus. My prediction is in light of the climate in, current, in which we currently live, um, likely there will be more requirements of documentation that the student is safe to return, um, that they will be required to maybe check in with the counseling center or a therapist on a periodic basis, depending on individually what they require, and so on and so forth. But of course, you also have the confidentiality issue and the informed consent issue. So making a student sign a waiver is really not consistent with what our usual practice is. And there's controversy on both sides as to whether you should mandate that students sign a waiver and allow you to get the information 
or is that confidentiality so um, so important that you may not require that information? Um, schools are basically are sometimes making deals with students. You know, we'll let you come back, but you have to let us have access to that information, or we'll keep an eye on you for a month or two. If things stabilize, we'll let it go. If they don't, we'll need more information. It really is very campus specific at this point. policy requiring the student to check in periodically, the appropriate student to check in periodically or to allow contact with the outside campus from time to time, that that would not be illegal. Right. It would, you know, the, the way the policy and guidelines would be developed would be taking into consideration the legal standards, the ethical guidelines, um, definitions in the legal requirements, and then coming up with a policy that would be as close to meeting the needs as, as it can be. You know, remember, each case is very different. Each situation is very different. So there has to be some amount of flexibility or fluidity in making these decisions. Um, and there has to be a certain amount of judgment on the part of the clinicians as to when is it safe enough to return to campus, what structures should be put in place or not. Mm -hmm. That's it? Okay. Thank you all very much. Thanks.